This is a University of Otago podcast. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Penny Field, and I've been lurking just for the last day and a half. The only member of the organising committee who hasn't done a presentation, um, because I was tasked or offered to kind of lead the reflection at the end, and so I've been thinking and reflecting on the themes that, that have come forward. Um, and asked my fellow pa panel members to share with me a very simple reflective technique, which is something that I really enjoy. And it's, what's excited you about the last day and a half? So what? What does it mean? And now what? So going forward. And so this is not us taking responsibility for pulling the whole day together, but really beginning to facilitate a conversation amongst everybody that's here about the meaningful things that have happened over the, the last day and a half. And I know that was a little bit challenging for Wing, so I offered to, to lead off with a bit of a, an illustration. <laughs> what, so what, now what? <laughs> um, We've had a lot of fun on the organising committee. It's been quite, quite a journey. And I think journeys for me is one of the themes that's really come through. We have journeyed a long way at Otago in the last 30 years. There has been a huge amount of innovation. Um, and that was certainly one of the themes that's continued to come through. Um, and innovation in, in the three themes of our symposium, in innovation in pedagogy, in innovation in technology, and innovation in support. And I think um, the fruit of that has, has been very obvious. Um, we've also, I've been excited by the stories, um, both the stories that have been told and the storytelling that's going on. That's a really lovely um, illustration, I think, of, um, of part of, yeah, the innovation. And also the sense of kind of community and connectedness. And I think Wing, you said society works through collaboration. And I think the collaborative kind of team spirit that is evident in distance education at Otago is, um, yeah, vibrant, really. Um, but the thing that kind of challenged, I think, ex and excited me was, was Som's initial comment. Um, are we on the fringe or are we at the centre? Or where do we sit? And I thought, yeah, okay. Um, that's an exciting thought. And I was excited, I think, early on by this idea of cross-fertilization between those in distance learning and, and those of us who teach face-to-face -face and that, that we can learn from it, each other. And um, is it Alison? No, somebody's comment this afternoon about, about being poor cousins and not being poor cousins, but actually working in parallel and, and informing it. And then it kind of got me thinking as to, to whether that's actually an unhelpful frame this idea of being on the fringe or being you know, more central. Um, and that if we continue to sort of view it like that, then there's always going to be some sort of divide or, or way of, and maybe the time has come to actually redefine and reframe who we are and what we're about in, in distance education. So that's my so what. <laughs> I asked Penny this question this morning. I was scared, I was worried. Wow, this is a huge question. But once she said about this, on the, whether you're on the center or, or at the fringe, then I said, oh, I will pick this up um, because I try to build on this, uh, steal her idea, so that I don't actually need to have my own ideas. And I've been thinking, depends on who you are, actually. If you are a policy maker, then if you think about whether you put distance learning at the center or not at the center, right? you have the authority of doing it. Whereas you are a small potato, like in a department, running a distance course. Does it matter whether your course is on the fringe or at the center? Really, does it matter? It does matter if you have no support. You all have to do it by yourself. Then it really matters, right? So it all depends on where you are. So in my own case, for example, I've been doing this for like nearly 20 years now. I have never had a question of whether it's, uh, I, I was on the center or on the fringe because I, I didn't actually need to ask, ask the question. I have never asked the question because I was not the policy maker. I was not Sarah. I was not a person responsible for the whole university's distance learning. I only want to look after the courses that we have to offer it 
the College of Education. I only have to worry about whether they are students. How do I expand the course offerings? As long as I can get the support from the college itself, and nobody actually prevent me from doing anything, I will, I'm very happy. So I, I don't care whether I'm at the center or at the, on the fringe. Is it okay? <laughs> I'm also at the college and have a different perspective because I get to deal with all the paperwork and admin that Wing avoids. And so I definitely would have said that we were on the fringes distance as I tried to, you know, fill in, fill in paper, new paper forms that wanted me to talk about contact hours and distance papers and sort of things. But it was, it was Diane who, who converted it and said, well, you know, is being on the fringe necessarily a bad thing? And then I was, I was thinking about it last night and thinking, actually, I don't think fringe and centre is the right kind of idea. I think we're on the forefront because what we've had to do in distance education and what we've seen examples of is lots of innovative, technology, um, innovative pedagogy and technology use. We've really had to think about what we're doing in teaching and learning and how we can make it work for our students. And often what we've seen is that those have then been adopted by people who are teaching face to face and I know certainly that I often change, you know, when I, when I did teach face to face, I often ended up using techniques that I developed because of the needs of my distance students. And so I kind of see it more of a, you know, we're, we're kind of continually pushing the boundaries and going what can we do and how can we make this work for our students and that's rubbing off on the rest of the university. So I saw it more of an innovation. <laughs> but where the challenges come for me is hearing all the great things people are doing and thinking, why didn't I know about that? You know. We're a small community within, within the university, but we're not actually very good at telling each other what we're doing and what's working and what's not working. And I mean, you know, certainly events like this are great, and I know that, you know, first Bill and then Sarah, it's, it's one of the things that I know they've often lamented is how can we get people to put down whatever they're doing and come and talk with each other and, and share ideas and, and really push this further. And I think that's the, for me, that's the challenge going forward, is to take the momentum from something like this and actually make it survive the PBRF marking, you know, <laughs> drudgery that is awaiting us all. <laughs> I make it sound some <laughs> My few thoughts um, related to many of the things that have already been said. Um, I've been excited and interested in and really and surprised, but also it's confirmed my knowledge that there's some wonderful practice out there, that people are very open to thinking about different ways of going about um, uh, creating really good learning opportunities for their students and their willingness to have a go and experiment and uh, to try stuff out and not be, not be stymied by the, the, the barriers that seem to be looming around them, but just to try and find a little hole in there and scratch away and, and make it work. Um, so what? Um, I think this means for me that there is a thriving distance education community in this university, and I knew that before, but this confirms that. I, um, it, it reconfirms again that, that we have lots to share. Um, it makes me wonder though, now what, should we be, you know, the label distance education identifies us, but it also immediately causes a barrier for other people, perhaps. Um, it's not for me, or oh, that's about that stuff. I'm not involved in that, so I'm not going to perhaps come to an event like this or uh, read that email that says there's something going on about this workshop or this event or this report or this seminar about whatever the topic is, is if we have this label. Um, but alongside that too, how can a distance learning office uh, generate some means for making the sharing of the of the good practice happen more widely amongst ourselves, but also outside this group or uh, across the university where um, with, with staff who are not teaching at a distance I think in it's the thoughts. It's Song's turn. Oh, no, 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 I think Sarah has raised a very important question, really. Because when I look around, every one of us here either we'll be teaching a distance course or supporting a distance course or a student in distance course, right? 
So we are somehow related to distance teaching in this university in certain ways, right? So we, this symposium is great, always, eh? We share what we have learned, and then we move forward, right? That's good. But we are preaching to the converted, in a sense, right? For me, it's an interesting two days, because I have learned so much that I had no idea before. But then, when I go back, I was, I was okay, I'm still the one that who's doing it. Karen's still the one doing it. We, has, we only have a very small group of people teaching it at college. So how can we actually expand this further to include if next time, the next symposium, we have half of the people not teaching distance courses at all, not related to distance teaching at all, I will be thrilled. I will be very, very happy because that, that means we're expanding our community. So, but if you ask me how to do it, I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm confident that if we work together, and if we discuss further, if we can have an ongoing discussion of this, I'm sure we will come up with ways of recruiting, expanding, whatever you like, to form a larger community. Not a problem. I, I actually had put some slides up. I, mean, I had the privilege um, today to sit quietly at the back and just um, listen and, and take down some notes, which I did. Um, but because we're in these models, I'm not going to get up and see if I can remember much of what I put there. Um, the, the, the things that I heard uh, yesterday and today is um, uh, a lot about online education, a lot about online learning and people using words distance education and online education and online learning interchangeably, as if they were the same things, which is not uncommon. People around the world do the same sort of thing. So, so the question that I have for you is, is, is that your model of distance education? And then what are the boundaries of that? What are the threshold principles of that? And the sorts of things that we heard, which uh, we've uh, articulated already, interaction, independence, flexibility, community of inquiry, and that sort of thing, you know, all those sorts of things that we are familiar with. So one of the things that I th most of you will agree with me when, when I say that distance education by necessity forced us to think about the pedagogy. I mean, when was Gordon, an ophthalmologist, talking about pedagogy? I mean, struggling with the term pedagogy. This is true. This is true of most, most academics, you know, they, uh, in, in non-education areas, they've never thought clearly about learning and teaching. Distance education forced us to do that. So the, the, the issue that, that I was thinking about also is how much of this is just good practice? How much of this is just best practice? We're doing the best we can for our group of learners, be it MBA students or optometrists or ophthalmologists or whoever. So, so, so is it distance education? Or is it a matter of terminology? Why are 30 people here and, and, and 33,000 people who could be here are not here? That's a question we should be asking, you know. If this is good practice, we're doing great work. You know, Sarah said so. Great stories here, great experiences. This is great teaching. So said he. But what's going on? Why aren't the others here? And that's the thing that I'm struggling with. I wanted. If, Sarah, I was going to say it's Friday afternoon, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in the middle of exam period. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, to pick, can I pick up on Wing's point? I mean, I wondered if others had thoughts about ways we can enlarge the conversation and enlarge the community. Kelly. Um, and maybe also to Sam's point about why isn't everyone else here? Why is it just us? And I think what I've found from talking to other people that are committed to distance learning is we're a bit of a thorn in people's in the side. We're a bit of, we're sort of, uh, what was that word you used, Karen? Like we're that we're sort of those next the next thinkers, and that might not be your average. That's that is sort of who we are, and that's great. But it's 
Um, where was my point? And um, so what I've done, my, the thing that I do specifically to try and increase our, the, the knowledge about distance around the, around the school is when I get those emails, specifically I'm remembering, I got an email from a student that was for law. I, I am in the medical school um, saying something, something, something about distance. And so I got in touch with the people over in law school and, and it was this one, they teach one paper or two papers by distance. They don't teach, I was like, so how come you don't teach the rest of them by distance? And I just put that question out to the staff member who I got, and I was trying to find the email real quick, what they said back. It was, it was, it, it was you know, some, something, but I think just sort of chipping away at those people that you meet in the tea room. So how come you can't do this by distance? You know, how, how, why do you have to have exams? Why can't you do that assessment online? Um, you know, you can, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in Moodle and Blackboard and it's not that hard. So um, that's kind of my, what I try. It's not like an. Yeah. No, no, no. I also don't think it's unique to distance. I bet if this was a generic teaching and learning session, at the, especially at this time of year, but I mean, I've been to several HUD sessions and this would be an outstanding turnout. So I think it's also just a function of being at a university where, you know, teaching is important, but research is what's publicly important, certainly. And we'll, we can argue about that later. But, um, but I wonder if one of the things is, we keep labelling things as distance education, but really the principles of good distance education are often the principles of good education. And although they may manifest in different ways, perhaps we need to be talking more about education and good education mm. and pushing it that way. And perhaps saying, you know, technology enhanced learning or you know making the most of Moodle to teach your course or Blackboard or whatever and pitching it there and having it sponsored by the distance learning office but having it with a wider focus so that people can actually see it as relevant although given the general apathy towards teaching seminars who knows <laughs> uh, Kia ora koutou. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the organising committee um, first and foremost, um, I was one of those who I can't afford to be here, is what I said in my brain, I'd registered, um, and I'm really glad that I've come and I've stuck out both days. Um, I think that it's important for us to be here, I've, as you know from yesterday I'm just dipping my toes into teaching, um, distance education, um, or t teaching a distance paper, um, and I think it's important to hear the successes. Um, it's been fantastic for me to listen to um, the, the fantastic programs that we're offering at Otago and also um, Dai who came down from Waikato um, and I was, because I'm um, a Waikato alumni, did my undergrad there and um, I was thinking while she was talking, I wonder if she knows Nola, I wonder if she knows Nola. So that was a, um, a fantastic connect to make with her. But um, sitting here I've also found it really not um, valuable to listen to the pitfalls as well. So, um, you know, because like I said, new to um, working in the distance um, arena as well. But um, I, I would agree with Karen. Um, I've come from the primary sector, so I've been at Otago for eight years now. And um, I think that from uh, having worked previously in the primary sector and um, working in uh, Māori medium education as well, as the mainstream sector, um, you know, we used to sit around on a day, uh, not sit around, but on a daily basis, have conversations about our teaching and learning practice all the time, um, when you could. And, you know, that's something that I've really missed um, coming into the tertiary sector. So we do this when we have our lunch breaks um, with my colleagues um, on, on our level. And I've noticed coming to um, the spotlight on teaching and learning um, forums that even if a, I, uh, I'm really pleased that this is, we're here to celebrate um, the 30 years, but um, like I said, being new to this forum, that we actually get to speak specifically about distance education. But um, from the short time that I've been at Otago, um, you know, we don't have enough conversations about our practice. Um, don't even get me started about the evaluation and the assessment side of it, but just sharing our stories about our practice, the good things that we do, but it's really important for us to 
hear about the pitfalls like we have been talking about the stories that we've heard. So thank you everyone for sharing. Um, it's been really valuable for myself and I'm sure my colleague um, would say the same thing here from our department. Um, to Timu, I think we have been teaching, like I said yesterday, in our Minds program for um, since 2005 when our program went online. Um, but you know, Karen's going to be the pro program coordinator of the program of um, the of the Minds program next year, like halfway through. So it's very important. And like I said, my paper is one of those offerings in there. So I think between us, we're going to get some um, really good ideas about how we're going to zhuzh it up and um, have some other ideas. So it's been really fantastic to listen to how other people are doing things um, differently and getting great ideas. So thanks, everyone, thanks, for sharing. Thanks, Tangyui. Uh, Claire, then Hester, then Paul. Oh, maybe I should go last and then I'll decide I don't need to speak at all. Um, it's, I've been really enjoyed the last two days. It's made me really nostalgic. And I think, you know, it seems like yesterday and I wish I was still here. Um, I listened to what Sam was saying about centre and fringe and I remember the conversations that have gone on over the years about the convergence of everything and how it's really all about good practice and being passionate about teaching and learning. And that's what's really important. And I know all that, and I really agree with you. That's really what it's all about. But I just want to say, the problem with convergence and online, we're all using the same technologies and we're all now caring about teaching and learning. The loser in that ultimately is the distant student that lives in the fishing village and come from an Inuit community and suddenly 60% of your distant students are actually on campus and so they become the forefront and the institution forgets about them. So I'm not saying I haven't heard wonderful things, I'm just saying whatever you do, talking about open learning, flexible, flipped, all of this, keep the name on Sarah's office. Because once you just say we're all about open and flexible learning, they'll say, well, we've got CALT. So if we've got the CALT committee, uh, what do we need her for? We've got bogs, we've got bugs, we've got quality advancement. So why do we need this office that says distance? So I'm saying whatever for you have and how we're all agreed it's about good teaching and learning, keep the name on Sarah because somebody has to stand up and say there is actually a distance student out there who is not on this campus using modern technologies. So hang on to the title, whatever you do. Don't change it to the open and something flexible office. Mm -hmm. Or they'll, you know. Yeah. I agree with you, actually. <laughs> well, when we were starting the online MBA, we, I actually do a bit of research on other universities, what they do. And of course, one of the complaints about distance or whatever form is online or, or global MBA as some other university calls it. The main thing is uh, one of the concerns was actually low engagement. And because of the availability of technology today, we can actually increase that level of engagement. So distance learning is no longer like it was say 20, 30 years ago where university release a set of content, the student read it and then go somewhere, sit for an exam. And the only benefit they have for any engagement probably is perhaps only an email. You know, those were the old days. And I've even seen some of the content of some of these old programs. They were, they were pretty badly prepared, as a matter of fact. I, that, at least those that I've seen were, wasn't something that I would claim as world-class, they're really very poor quality. I could probably buy a textbook and it pro uh, provide me a better information than those items. So I will agree with Karen, with, with the uh, current technology we have, we are no longer at the fringe, no longer suffering a parity of esteem. We are actually at the forefront 
because some of, we are using some of the latest technology right now in order to, to, uh, to, to deliver, sorry, I'm going to use that word again, to deliver uh, our curriculum and our programs. So, so I don't think we are at any point suffering a, a parity of esteem. At least I don't feel that way. Um, and we, distance learning in terms of student number account for right now 10% of the university population. But I suspect that if we look carefully at postgraduate, it's something that Sarah might want to consider. If you look at postgraduate student number, I suspect that we are actually a very large part of it because I think we definitely have a very strong place in, uh, in the postgraduate studies because what I've, what, from what uh, my presentation probably have touched on that point that a lot of our students cannot come on campus because they have good jobs or they have family commitments. We are catering to a mature group of students. So I think, I believe that it has a very big part to play in the postgraduate studies. So if we start looking at it, we might actually find ourselves being perhaps even half of the student number, accounting for half of the postgraduate student number. Yep. It's actually about 23, between 23 and 24 percent of the postgraduates study by distance. And most of, the dis most of those courses are coursework courses, not research masters and PhD type courses. They are postgraduate diploma and certificate for the most part. And there's mas lots of masters. I, I think one of the things about this uh, Otago is that it will always be somewhat ambivalent about all of us in this room. Because um, if we scratch too much below the surface, of course, we are a campus university. And our vice chancellor rightly emphasizes student experience, by which she means 18 to 22 year olds growing up in Castle Street or something, you know? Um, and, and, and that's great, I think. And, you know, one of the wonderful things about Otago is that our students learn all sorts of things by being away from home and being in colleges and all. all. So, so distance learning will always be uh, slightly alternative lifestyle to the mainstream. And I th but I think the good thing about this gathering is that we can get together and, you know, we're slightly unusual people in our divisions, but when we get together we realise, you know, how great it is to get together and to support each other. And that uh, we're all doing different things uh, with the same sort of goal of reaching those who can't come here. Uh, perhaps the, the, the most important thing is is overcoming the isolation that we do feel in our own patches uh, and sharing best practice. You know, I didn't realise you were doing that and oh, you've come up with this great solution to this problem that we've got and we never thought about doing it that way. You know, so the sort of value of something like this that we should do more often is of just overcoming isolation and sharing best practice uh, and celebrating being slightly unusual, which is great. A good reason for a 30 year celebration. Well, I'm saying, yes. well, I'm saying, yeah. <coughs> well, oh, sorry. Lost my train of thought. Thank you. So, just to follow on from that, um, some of us in the room here remember not so long ago where we all sat, we did the distance learning forums, and we all sat around with um, microphones in front of us and you pressed a button, and we all spoke and we connected. <clears throat> and maybe we need to re um, resurrect that in, in the form of Zoom where we could potentially all be sort of sitting in our offices and, you know, and connecting around the country. I think that would have quite a bit of merit. So I'd just like to put that out there. G Gary Nixon spoke of their kind of virtual tea room, didn't he? That, and to kind of perhaps mimic that for the distance learning community kind of idea. Yeah. Me again. I've been sitting here doodling on my book and the t Four words that I've brought down is innovation and interaction, collaboration between bodies. Now, speaking from a student perspective, all those plus everything else that I've heard this afternoon sort of backs up what I've said to you all yesterday, how distance education 
will be the way of the future and it will take far greater prominence now, then than it is now. And if, and if we, we mustn't be afraid to, excuse me, stick out like a sore thumb or be willing to challenge the ingrained views of others because we have got the courage to, be, to step outside the box and to say, yes, we do work in distance education. And, I'm, and we are proud of what we do. So my final word to you all this afternoon, again, as a student, is stick with it. And even though you might get kicked in the teeth sometimes, or in the rear end, don't, don't be afraid. But put, just get out there and pull finger because there are lots of students like myself who appreciate distance learning. And for those of us who are 25 plus in particular, no, we're not 20 to 18 to 20 years old and we don't indulge in Castle Street or whatever. <coughs> so, um, but we still have the experience, the student experience, even though we may not necessarily be on campus. But I believe that distance education brings us all together in one large whānau. So whether we are in Sydney as per Gordon's students, or the Cooks, or Tonga, or Samoa, or Fiji, or whether they come to us, we are still part of a big whānau. And if we're willing to stick our necks out and say, go for it, we'll never lose that touch. Hey. Thanks, Carol. Um, I've actually been just an observer being an old retired person. However, uh, I just have one really question. How valuable is the distance learning to the University of Otago's hierarchy? And what credibility do they give distance learning? That's really all I want to say, because I really feel that's at the bottom of it all. We're on the defensive a bit by the sound of it, um, but are we recognised and are we valued by these, the Senate, the Council? Are we? I think we are. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just before I retired two years ago, um, they made me the Associate Dean of Postgraduate Education for the medical school, because uh, nobody else wanted the job. Um, and I undertook to do an audit of all the postgraduate courses that are taught at the medical school. And I've written down four points that emerged, two of which are negative and two of which are positive. So I'll give you the, the negative ones first. There needs to be a culture change within the organisation. Because I was asking, a lot of these were face to face, and I said to them, do you want to do a distance talk course? Why not? Because you get a much bigger audience, etc." And they said, there needs to be a culture change. The culture change needs to be, how can we help you? Not, how can we obstruct you? An awful lot of the time you come up against all sorts of barriers, which you're expected to solve or knock down or what have you, rather than people say, look, I can help you with this, I can easily show you how to do this, how to get this through the appropriate committees or what have you. That doesn't seem to be happening enough. Second thing is, there was no incentive. It's just more work. Nobody's going to get any more money for it, nobody's going to get any more promotion for it, they're just going to get more work. So there's a disincentive in a way to do it. The two positive points which I'd like to leave you with, because I think I don't want to finish on a negative note, it's the way of the future for Otago, particularly for postgraduate medical education. It, is, it really does suit Otago down to the ground. And the third point, the fourth point rather, is the 180 point masters gives us a huge opportunity. And that, that really is um, starting to be understood by and more and more people. Sorry. Sam, did you want to? There are a number of things that we could talk about. I mean, um, 
that the vibes that I'm getting here are different from the vibes that I get in other parts of the world. I spent two two weeks to, uh, just prior to coming here in Beijing, and before that I was in Germany. I'm, I'm not saying that just by the way, but it, it's the messages that I'm getting. Um, a clear point of this uh, uh, thing about distance education. I've been editor of a journal called Distance Education for 22 years, and I did what she said. I'm, I haven't changed the name, and yet it is the most widely read and highly regarded journal in the world, in the field. So something must be right about the term distance education. It's the perception. The Americans think that distance education is the best thing in the world, and therefore the journal is up the radar, or going through the radar. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm not advocating dumping terms. You know, Terms will come and go. That, that's, that's, that's one thing for sure. Um, but I think we need to think about the business that we're in. What are we trying to do? And this is why I was thinking about things like, what are we on about? It seems like we're just on about good practice, which Karen was saying. We, we should be talking about best learning and teaching practices. So, so one strategic advantage in, in being more open and, and widely accessible to other people is that people will see the relevance. If you keep yourself siloed in a corner, then people will think, well, you're serving a minority, therefore, you know, you're not, you're not important. We can do without you. So I think one thing that will be in our favor is to make ourselves more appealing, that look, what we do is good for everyone. So people see value in what you're doing, and that's all right, okay, so you're part of the larger group. And larger group attracts money, attracts support, attracts recognition. Smaller groups get relegated to the corner and to the sidelines. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think, I mean, on, on that note, I mean, looking forward and perhaps a voice or a message from this symposium would be about making ourselves more visible, expanding the the stretch of our tent, um, inviting more people into our community to kind of raise the profile, um, maintain the distinctive nature, but increase the profile of the very, very good work that's being done. <laughs> okay, on that note then, I think it's about time we wrapped this up. Um, can I just say a big thank you to everybody for participating, for being here. Some of you stuck out the whole thing. Um, others of you had to come and go, and that's, but it was, it's been great seeing you. Thank you very much to everybody here. Thank you particularly to Som for traveling so far and putting yourself out for so long. He's only, only just started. <laughs> Got a long way to go yet. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you uh, to, to everybody who's organized things in the background as well. Um, yes, I could go on and on. And I, should have had a list in my hand, but um, that's the end of the symposium for this time, for this year. We will have another one in two years' time, but maybe we'll pitch it differently. And next time we'll have, uh, we, might, we won't be cel celebrating thir a 30-year anniversary, but maybe we'll be um, inviting or having the presence of more people other than just distance learning people because we've thought about how we might pitch it more widely. Mm. So thank you. All the very best, everyone.